Hi everyone, it's Joe. Welcome to PC Neurobiology Online. Uh, this is the second to the last lecture for the semester. And the paper we're going to talk about today is titled Mutations in the CNGB3 Gene Encoding the Beta Subunit of the Cone Photoreceptor Cyclic GMP Gated Channel are Responsible for Acromytosia CH. 3M3 linked to chromosome 8Q21. <laughs> it's kind of a mouthful. But what they did in this paper is they figured out the gene that's responsible for colorblindness in the individuals in Ping Lap that were highlighted in the book by Oliver Sacks, Island of the Colorblind. And before the semester's over, I'll going to tell you one more story, <laughs> like it or not, sorry, uh, but I have a, a personal interest in this particular uh, subject matter, and the reason is because, as you guys know, I'm into scuba diving, and there's a very famous place in Micronesia, and Ping Lap is part of Micronesia, called Truck Lagoon, and let me erase this and give you a little bit on Truck Lagoon. Delete. I'm going to show you in a minute in Google Maps um, where I'm talking about, but uh, Micronesia is in the Pacific Ocean, and if you have Japan, you have Japan here, and, and then the Philippines are down here, and this might not be totally accurate, but then you have the coast of the U.S. in Baja, in Mexico, so California is here, and then you have Hawaii, which is pretty far out in the Pacific Ocean, and then you have Truck Lagoon and other islands that dot the Pacific Ocean. And it turns out after the First World War, Japan was given these islands by the Allied forces. And secretly, they decided to build runways and naval bases on the islands. And, you know, this is before satellite and things like that to monitor the situation. So they built some runways on these little islands in naval bases and then they attacked the US at Pearl Harbor during World War II. And this started the war against Japan. The US was already fighting Germany, Nazi Germany, and the bombing of Pearl Harbor set into play an attempted attack on Japan. But since they had these runways and naval bases, J Japan that is, they were able to intercept U.S. forces and attack the U.S. Navy. So it was some really bloody battles at both on the islands and between ships, and eventually, of course, the U.S. made it to mainland Japan and ended the war with the atomic bomb, which was very unfortunate. But at any rate, they also bombed this truck lagoon, T-R-U-K, and they sent about 50 ships to the bottom of the ocean, and so it's the best wreck diving in the world, and interestingly enough, the wrecks ended up forming artificial reefs. So there's a lot of coral and fish and things like that that live on the wreck. And since all of the ships went down on a single day in 1944, scientists have been able to compare the coral reef growth and what lives on the wrecks 
at diff under different environmental conditions. So one wreck might be literally sunk to the bottom, but large enough to actually still stick out above the water's surface. So there's a lot of, of light there and corals need light because they have a photosynthetic algae that lives in their tissue called zooxanthellae and they need the zooxanthellae to provide some nutrients to the coral polyp. And then another ship might be in, you know, 200 feet of water where there's low light levels and it's harder for the zooxanthellae to grow. So anyway, ecologists have used these ships over the years to compare different ecological conditions that the wrecks are, each of the wrecks are found in. So when I was a graduate student at Brown, I went with my girlfriend at the time, Maureen, who was a very good diver. She's an MD. And uh, we went to truck and we dove on about 15 wrecks. And then this past summer, I went back to Truck Lagoon for six weeks, and I dove on about 22 wrecks um, last August. So let's take a look at where exactly where Ping Lap is. Okay, Ping Lap. So I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the geography of Ping Lap in a minute. It's a coral atoll, and I'm going to explain that. But anyway, this is the view of Ping Lap in Google Maps, and if you look at the satellite image, you can see this is the runway right here. That's a, an airport runway, so it gives you a little bit of the idea uh, of the size of these three islands that make up the Ping Lap Atoll, and it's, I looked up the acreage and this is about 450 acres, and Providence College is about 105 acres. So it's just four times the size of the Providence College campus. And the islanders of Ping Lap, the island of the colorblind, live on this. I think most of the people live on this main island. Here's the runway again. I'll blow it up a little bit more. And now you can see these are the rooftops of the houses on Ping Lap. So most of the islanders live pretty close to the airport here. And um, it's a pretty small island. Uh, of course, th this here is all coral reef. And again, I'll get to that in a moment when I talk about what an atoll is. But just to show you how remote this place is. Let me go back to the map. So this summer I flew to this island, which is called Ponape, and I was there for about a week. And then I flew here. This is Truck, where the shipwrecks are. This little, this is another coral atoll. And then eventually I flew to, let's see if I can make this a little bit bigger. I flew to Palau and I dove here for two weeks. This is some of the best reef diving in the world, particularly if you like to see big, big animals like sharks and manta rays and stuff like that. And I saw sharks every day that we dove in Palau. Uh, I mean, I'm not a huge shark guy, but they're pretty interesting to watch. And so if I kind of zoom back out here, uh, okay, here's Japan, and here are the Philippines, and here's Hawaii right here, and then of course, the California coastline. So this is, <laughs> pretty remote. I mean, they're really, they're in the middle of absolutely nowhere. And they live on an island that's uh, four times the size of the Providence College campus. That gives you, you know, a little idea of um, what they're up against. And after I returned from the trip with Maureen, I, I went home and one of my housemates had the book Island of the Colorblind on the dining room table 
And I thought, oh boy, I wonder if this is about Micronesia because I knew that there was a colorblind issue. And also they have a problem with night blindness, which turns out to be a vitamin A deficiency. But at any rate, uh, I read the book and became more and more interested in that story. And this time, when I returned, I wanted to try to fly to Pinglap. And actually, Providence College kindly gave me enough money uh, to make the flight from from Ponape, which is here, which is the first island I went to, to Pinglap. And if you look at the scale bar, this is 50 miles. So, you know, it's about whatever, maybe 50. You know, it's like maybe 150 miles, 125 miles, or 150 miles. And I couldn't figure out how to book a flight from Ponape to Pinglap, but once I got to Ponape, I talked to the people at the airport, and I could get a lift for about a hundred bucks. The problem is they only fly there a couple times a month. So if you fly in to Pinglap, you're stuck there for about three weeks, two or three weeks, before you can get the flight to go back to Ponape, and that was, I only had six weeks, and I just couldn't do it. But what was I gonna do in Ping Lap for three weeks? So I ended up bailing out on that part of the trip. So let's talk about coral atolls for a minute. So the Pacific Ocean is known as the Ring of Fire because there's a lot of volcanic activity all around the Pacific Ocean. And it turns out that, uh, you know, if you have uh, the ocean, whoops, let's see here, come on, the ocean and uh, the, the bottom, the seafloor, and you have a volcanic eruption, of course, the lava explodes out of the earth. And in the end, uh, once the eruption stops, then you'll have a volcano. And volcanic rock, it turns out, is not very strong. And Charles Darwin correctly hypothesized that the, the volcano sinks under its own weight. So it falls back down over time, uh, back towards the sea floor. And, but what happens is that coral you know, this is a, you know, from the top, it's a tube. I'll draw that in a minute, but you guys know what I'm talking about. And it, it turns out that coral, coral polyps uh, can, can adhere to hard substrates like volcanic rock and form a reef. So coral, you know, binds and grows all along the hard surface of the volcanic rock in the layer where light can penetrate, which is called the photic zone. And the reason why the coral can't grow, or most species can't grow below the photic zone is because of those zooxanthellae that I just mentioned that live in their tissue. So you have a coral polyp with, with these beautiful tentacles, and then the zooxanthellae live inside the tissues of the coral polyp. And of course, the coral's an animal, uh, very similar actually to hydroids, and we found APP in hydroids. Um, but at any rate, uh, the zooxanthellae uh, carry out photosynthesis and provide nutrients ultimately to the coral polyp. So the corals, most species of coral, require zooxanthellae to live, and they can't live below the photic zone. And it turns out that the coral bleaching that's happening throughout the world, particularly in the Great Barrier Reef, that is, uh, that's caused by global warming, is thought to cause the zooxanthellae 
to leave the coral polyp or get spit out by the coral polyp and that causes the coral polyp to die and uh, the, the reefs in Australia are being destroyed. So at any rate, over time, this thing sinks and I'll just draw a second diagram of the same structure, but you know, thousands of years go by and this volcano sinks and with it this band of coral sinks so this band of coral is now you know down here but as this thing sinks new coral can grow within the photic zone so this coral dies because it starts to sink below the photic zone and then new coral polyps uh, bind to the volcanic rock and then grow into coral reefs. And that process continues to happen until, after a while, the lip of the coral reef, I mean this part right here, right here, uh, gets close to the surface and there's then dead coral here, and dead coral here, and dead coral here, and so on. And then there's live coral that's around here, but these stick up, the, the mouth can stick up, and the volcanic rock breaks down, and you get sand deposits, and you know, the coconut floats over, and you get a palm tree, and so on, and you end up getting a ring of islands. So if you look down from the top, you get, you know, structures that look like, like, like this, and these are all islands, and there's some inlets here like this, and I'll, I'll go back and show you Pinglap again. But in the case of the uh, Japanese military in Truck Lagoon, they would bring their boats into the harbor in in, I mean, into the mouth of the volcano, which is water, and here it's a lagoon. And then they would dock their ships inside the lagoon here. And then they built a runway like this so that they could fly airplanes in and out. And then they would live on the islands. And then you know, they had a naval base. And when they wanted to attack the U.S., they'd just go out and attack them and then come back to shore. And at some point, the U.S. bombed all of the ships that were in the lagoon and made this really wonderful artificial reef, of course, at the expense of a lot of Japanese sailors' lives. So let's just go back and I'll show you that image again of Pinglap. So see, it's kind of a, I mean, it's not a perfect circle, but you kind of get a ring of these islands and then a deep lagoon in the middle. Let's go back to the satellite picture. So this is what it looks like here. And let's see if we can go to truck. Here, here's truck. So this has very little land mass too. Um, but I stayed in Wino here. And I stayed here at this called Blue Lagoon, Truck Blue Lagoon Resort. And then every day we would leave from this area and we would dive all throughout this lagoon. These are all little tiny islands out at the outer edge and then this drops off into fairly deep water uh, but the shipwrecks are all here in this area. I don't know if we'll be able to see any. It doesn't look like the resolution is very good in this part of the world. So this is the island of the colorblind and similar to the Ty Sachs case this autosomal recessive disorder was also propagated through inbreeding 
obviously. So there must have been an islander that had a sporadic mutation, and that mutation got passed on through the generations, so its prevalence was pretty high in the community. And, uh, you know, the people that live on the island can only leave the island once every two weeks, provided that the weather is good. So uh, the population is pretty small, and it is probably fairly likely that you're going to end up with your cousin or a second cousin or something like that, and you end up having scenarios where they're having children that have the double recessive since it's so prevalent in the population, and those individuals end up being colorblind. So let's get to the paper. So the paper is not just about the ping lapis and the island of the colorblind. It turns out, even though this disease is extremely rare, it is found in other populations in Europe and so on. And this group found in some other families, not related to the ping lapis, uh, Europeans, that there was a mutation in chromosome 2 that caused colorblindness, and that protein turned out to be the alpha subunit of the cyclic GMP gated channel in cone receptors, a key player of the phototransduction cascade responsible for the membrane hyperpolarization on light stimulation and photoreceptors. I'm just quoting from the paper, reading from the paper. But look, where have we seen cyclic GMP gated channels, buck and axle, on how odors detected, right? G proteins. Okay, so they found this mutated molecule on chromosome two, and if they have the double recessive, that is those individuals in that family, the families that they looked at in Europe, if they have two copies, then they're colorblind. But if they test the ping lapis, it turns out that they don't have that mutation. So it meant that they must have another mutation that causes the same phenotype. So this group used positional cloning, and we said before that positional cloning is a type of linkage analysis that allows them to determine whether the disease co-purifies with markers, that is, genetic differences that exist between us. And if you know where the marker is located and it co-segregates with the disease, that helps you locate where the disease gene is, what chromosome it's on, what specific gene it is, and hopefully specifically the mutation. So they carry out this positional cloning, which again is a lot of work, and they figured out that in the ping lapis and in many other families who are colorblind throughout the world who didn't have a mutation on the gene in chromosome 2 have mutations in a second gene it's located on chromosome 8. So there are only two figures that I want to go over in this paper. The first is figure 1a, which are the pedigrees of these different families. One of the families, of course, are the ping lapis, but the other families are, are families from around the world that happen to have this particular mutation, which we're going to get to in a little while. And then the other figure I want to talk about is figure 4, which is a northern blot, which is a way of looking at messenger RNA expression. In figure 1a, they show a variety of pedigrees, and they name them crow 4, crow 8, crow 12, crow 17, and so on. Crow stands for acromytosia number four or seven or whatever, I'm sorry, four or eight or 12. And those are the, that's just the nomenclature of the families. So they're studying hundreds of families. I mean, it's rare, it's a rare phenomena, but it does occur. And they show Crow 184, so that there's at least 184 families that they're studying. And they're trying to figure out what mutation causes color blindness in all of those different families. So it could be that the majority of families have mutations in that cyclic GMP gated channel that's on chromosome 2, but these families 
exhibit mutations in this newly found gene on chromosome 8. I mean, that's the point, okay? So we're really only looking at 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 11 families, and they're just labeled the, the family number that's in the study. Of course, squares are male, circles are female, shaded circles or squares are afflicted, and then it turns out underneath the symbol is the mutation in this particular gene if it's known. So there are only two figures that I want to go over in this paper. The first is figure 1a, which are the pedigrees of these different families. One of the families, of course, are the ping lapis, but the other families are are families from around the world that happen to have this particular mutation, which we're going to get to in a little while. And then the other figure I want to talk about is figure four, which is a northern blot, which is a way of looking at messenger RNA expression. In figure 1a, they show a variety of pedigrees, and they name them Crow 4, Crow 8, Crow 12, Crow 17, and so on. Crow stands for acromytosia, number 4 or 7 or whatever, I'm sorry, 4 or 8 or 12. And those are the, that's just the nomenclature of the families. So they're studying hundreds of families. I mean, it's rare, it's a rare phenomena, but it does occur. And they show Crow 184, so that there's at least 184 families that they're studying. And they're trying to figure out what mutation causes color blindness in all of those different families. So it could be that the majority of families have mutations in that cyclic GMP gated channel that's on chromosome 2, but these families exhibit mutations in this newly found gene on chromosome 8. I mean, that's the point, okay? So we're really only looking at 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 11 families, and they're just labeled the, the family number that's in the study. Of course, squares are male, circles are female, shaded circles or squares are afflicted, and then it turns out underneath the symbol is the mutation in this particular gene if it's known. Okay, quickly one more time. They're studying a disease of total color blindness in a large number of families. They find in one family that they have a mutation in a gene on chromosome 2 that encodes the alpha subunit of the cyclic GMP gated channel, which we'll get to. They test all of the other families, and many of them have mutations in that particular gene, but there's a subset of families that lack any mutations in that particular molecule. So they use positional cloning again in the families that didn't have mutations, and they find another gene that co-segregates with the disorder in most of these 11 families. It turns out there's one that, that doesn't have a mutation in this particular gene, and I'll get to that again. In these 11 families, they find six different mutations in this particular gene, and I want to go through those pedigrees and show you those six different mutations. In these 11 families, they find six different mutations in this particular gene, and I want to go through those pedigrees and show you those six different mutations. Okay, so let's start with Crow 4. Crow 4 has a father and a mother who are unafflicted, and they have four children. They have a son, a son, a daughter, and a third son. And this son is the only individual in the family that's afflicted. If you look at the father, he has a mutation that's 1578.
G to an A conversion. So at so within the gene at position 1578, instead of a G, they have an A. And then they have a wild type mutation. The mother has the exact same thing, 1578 G to an A substitution and one wild type. This son is heterozygous, that is, they are a carrier, just like their mother and father, 1578 and a wild type. This individual is a carrier and this female is a carrier. So they all have this same genetic makeup. The son is afflicted. So as you would guess, this individual has two copies of 1578. And I looked in the paper and they say that this particular mutation messes up splicing. And so most likely there was an intron that remained in place which should have been removed in the process of, of the splice. The next family, Crow 8, we're going to skip for now, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Crow 12 has a father and a mother that are unafflicted. The father has an R to a 203X mutation, and the mother has 1148 delete C mutation. So this mutation is in with, within the coding sequence. So this is a splice site issue. This is a change in the nucleotide sequence within the coding sequence that changed the amino acid arginine at, at amino acid 203 to a stop codon. So this means that the protein was truncated. There was an early stop and it's a shorter, it wasn't completely generated. It's a smaller, just part of the protein sequence. And then their wild type, again, at one locus. The mom has a deletion in the nucleotide sequence and that would cause a frame shift mutation at nucleotide 1148. And if that's in the coding sequence, which it must be, that means that this C was removed and the next nucleotide shifted over. And from that point on, the amino acid sequence was incorrect. And most likely at some point, there's also an early termination signal. And she also has one wild type allele. The children are a son, three sons, and there's only two, well, there are two sons that are afflicted, this son and this son, and they say that this individual is a heterozygous carrier, so they have one copy, and it turns out the copy that he has is the 1148 delete C. So this individual received this mutation from the mother and one good copy from the father. Both of these individuals are afflicted and so they have the double mutation. They have the R203X, R203X, and the 1148 delete C. Okay, and this individual has that same genotype. All right, let me get rid of these. Okay, Crow 17 has a father who's unafflicted and a mother who's unafflicted. They have three children. They have, whoops, sorry, female, female, male. The father has the 1148 delete C that we just saw, and they have one wild type. 
The mom has a copy of the 1148, delete, C, and she also has a nucleotide deletion at 819 to 826. So whatever that is, you know, six or seven nucleotide uh, deletion. So they're missing a few amino acids and then there's a frame shift. So the amino acids are wrong after this region and there's an early termination signal. The interesting part of this is that she is unafflicted and this daughter is unafflicted, but this daughter is afflicted. And she has one copy of the 1148 delete C, which she must have gotten from her father because she also has the 819 to 826 delete from her mother. This son has the 1148 delete C and one wild type. So this son must have received this wild type from the father and this delete C from his mother. Since the afflicted daughter and the unafflicted mother each have the same two mutant genes, this must be an example of incomplete penetrance. Crow-19 has a father and a mother who are unafflicted, and it turns out that they don't know what these two people are. There's no information there. But they have two sons and a daughter that are all afflicted. And they say that this son has an E to an X at 336, 336X. This E is an amino acid, it's a glutamate. And X is a stop codon. So again, this is a type of early stop in this particular molecule uh, that, that uh, leads to a shorter protein. This in, um, and uh, then they also, oh, they have two copies, 32X, and the siblings the same. So all of these people have two copies of this early termination signal in the protein, which means that each one of these parents must harbor the E322X, 322E to 322X, and probably must, it suggests that they also have one wild type protein. Okay, let's skip to Crow 183. Now these are the Ping Lap Bees. So 183 are the Ping Lap Islanders, and they have a father and a mother who are both, whoops, unafflicted, and they have three sons, two that are unafflicted, and one that is afflicted. And they say that the father is an S 435F serine to phenylalanine. So this is a point mutation in the coding sequence that changed this amino acid from serine to phenylalanine, and then they have, the father has one wild type molecule, and of course, the mother must contain the same mutation because she descended from the same founder of this disease on Pinglap. So, I'm not, they might not be cousins or second cousins, but they're still pretty closely related to one another because they, they all come from this same lineage. And indeed, she has the S435F and one wild type. And as you would expect, this individual has two 
bad copies, S435F, S435F, and the other two siblings are heterozygous carriers, so they both have S435F and one wild type version of the molecule. Okay, one last thing to talk about here. If you look at Crow 8, which is the second family in the study, Crow 8, they have an unafflicted father and an unafflicted mother, and then an afflicted son and an afflicted daughter. And it turns out that they do not have a mutation in this particular gene. They also do not have a mutation in the gene found on chromosome 2. I mean, they were excluded from that study and added to this particular study, but in this case, they have neither of those mutations, either the chromosome 2 or the chromosome 8 mutation, which means there must be a third mutation in the genome that's responsible for colorblindness in this particular family. Finally, if we look at Crow 20, we have a father and a mother that are unafflicted. Father and mother. The father has the 1148 delete C, delete C mutation, and a wild type mutation, or what? I've said this a couple of times, wild type mutation. Obviously, it's not a mutation or wild type. Sorry about that. Yikes, the thing jumped. Let's just keep going. A wild type version of the gene and then an unknown. And that they have two children, both who are afflicted. So this daughter is afflicted and they have a son who's afflicted and it turns out that each of those have a 1148 delete C and a question mark and this this son has the exact same genotype so that's interesting because all of these families were screened for the, the alpha subunit of the cyclic GMP gated channel that was found on chromosome 2 and it also does not have a mutation she does not have a mutation and the two children do not have a mutation in this newly found gene so that again means that there must be some other gene that's responsible in these two cases okay let's just review the six different mutations the first was in crow 4 it's a 1, 5, 7, 8, that's the nu nucleotide number, G to an A substitution. And this they said this is a splice site problem in which the intron doesn't get properly spliced out. So it gets, into, gets inserted into the mature RNA molecule. And of course, once the exon is read, the following intron, if it's still there, it's going to result in improper amino acids and then probably an early termination signal. The second is a 1, 4, 1, 1, 4, 8, delete. C. This is in Crow 12 and others. And delete C. And this is a frame shift, shift mutation. And of course, once the C is removed, the next nucleotide is shifted over and the it's out of reading frame, and that's going to cause all those amino acids downstream to be incorrect. The third, which is also in Crow 12, 
is an R, which stands for arginine. That's an amino acid, of course, at the 203rd amino acid starting at the methionine of the coding sequence. And that is changed to a termination signal. So this is early termination for is another glutamate at 336x. So this is early termination also. The fifth is a single point mutation. This is in the ping lapis. S435F. So these are both early terminations. So it's a truncated molecule. In this case, it's just serine to phenylalanine. So it's a single point mutation and just a single uh, amino acid substitution. So there's a point mutation, but this is a single amino acid substitution. And then finally, in Crow 17, there's an 819 to 826 deletion, which is a nucleotide stretch that's deleted in this process. So this is another frame shift mutation. So there's two early terminal there's two frame shifts, there's a splice site problem, and then in our old pals, the islanders from Pinglap, they have a single point mutation that causes the disease on the island. Okay, so the last figure I want to talk about, I mean only two in this paper, is figure four, which is a northern blot. And we've said a number of times that northern blots are a way of looking at RNA expression. And the question is, where is the gene in question expressed? We know that it's on chromosome 8, and the gene, it turns out, is found only in one cell type, which is retina. There's a cell line here, which I don't want to worry about. There's testes, brain, heart, and liver. Testes, brain, heart, and liver. And they test it with a probe, and they get an RNA band only in retina, okay? So the whole time we've been talking, I've, I've been avoiding what this gene actually is. On chromosome two, we said that the mutation was in the alpha subunit of the cyclic GMP gated gated ion channel. Okay, this gene on chromosome 8 is the beta subunit of the cyclic GMP gated ion channel. And we have seen this cyclic GMP gated ion channel is very similar to what we talked about in buck and axel. We said that you have the cell membrane and you have a seven transmembrane G coupled protein receptor. Then you have a molecule. In this case, it's converting GT P to cyclic GMP, and then there was a channel that would be opened up by cyclic, in this case, by cyclic GMP. It was cyclic AMP. In the case of Buck and Axel, which allows ions to enter through the cell membrane. So these two molecules, the alpha subunit and the beta subunit, 
are two individual proteins that make up, that bind together to form this particular channel. And if you mutate the alpha subunit of the channel that's found on chromosome 2, and mutations in that gene are found in some families, or you mutate the beta subunit that's mutated in the families of this paper, this channel no longer works and you can't get ions to flow through the membrane. Interesting that both Buck and Axel, which is talking about how we smell, and this paper talking about how we see, both have this 7 transmembrane domain G protein coupled receptor set up. And we were talking about an odorant in the case of Buck and Axel, which binds to this receptor. In this case, it's light, colored light. These are found in the cones, which are responsible for detecting color. But if this is mutated, the individuals end up being colorblind. Okay, guys, that's it. I uh, went over our normal allotted time of 50 minutes for class by a minute and a half or so. Uh, we're getting there. One more lecture to go. Uh, please email me, uh, text me, call me if you have any questions. Uh, I'll do a review session, of course, before the exam or two, whatever we need to do. And uh, I'll talk to you on Friday. Bye-bye.